we invite the congregation to stand. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to laugh and a time to mourn. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. This is the Thanksgiving service for the life of the late Theodore Patrick Antonio Johnson is now officially called to order. We invite you to join, to, uh, join with us in singing the beautiful hymn, How Cheering Is the Christian's Hope. friends and family members gather now in our time of bereavement. I pray that with the tears you send your sweet comforter to comfort our hearts. May we think on good things and may your spirit joy our hearts in this time of deep, deep sorrow. I pray that the day's proceedings will go smoothly and that you will help us all here to gain, gather a blessing from the message that will be presented. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I invite you to turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 
We'll be reading verses 13 to 18. I will read in your hearing. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as those who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word. Which hope as much as there is room for tears, there will be room for laughter, and there will be room for smiling, and there will be room for just enjoyment of this experience as we reflect on the life of someone who made a big impact on this earth. Um, you know, Jesus stayed here for 30 odd years and he did so much. And you know, Theodore is not Jesus. But when we look and hear about his story, we'll see how Jesus acted in his life over his 30 odd years. So as you sit here, reflect on not just his passing, but on that day, that resurrection morning, when we'll hear not only our names, but the name Theodore, Patrick, Antonia Johnson, and hear his story which will be summarized for us now with a eulogy, which will be done by his sister and, no. oh, I'm sorry about that. There's gonna be a song by Praise Circle before we have that.
Amen. What an awesome rendition. Jesus' blood covers it all and reassures us that though weeping may endure for a night, what happens next? Joy comes in the morning. And so we have a slight amendment to our program. This, at this point, we'll be going, to, going into some of our tributes. And, uh, you know, one of the best things we have here on earth as we spend time is the relationships that we are able to form. And so, you know, as we are able to contemplate these relationships, you know, it sometimes gives us the impetus to just continue going forward. And Theo had a lot of great relationships that we'll be hearing from a number of persons now. And we will start with our brother, Romario Pine, who is a friend of Theo, uh, Denisa Saint, who is a friend also, and then Uncle, Uncle Tony Garwood. We'll go in that order. Romario Pine, Denisa Saint Fleur, and then Tony Garwood. Hey, um, Romario Pine here. Um, I'm doing this tribute to one of my friends. Consider more as a brother. Um, it's kind of hard, but uh, I try my best. So, um, Theo, Theodore Johnson, we've had a friendship for what? probably 20 years now. Um, it's one of the hardest things I've ever done to give a tribute to a friend that I lost. But um, our friendship has grown over the years based on the fact that I was sick and he would always, when I wasn't even in the hospital, I was always one of those persons who was never left my bedside. I remember when I was in Kingston, he was always by my bedside every night was the last person to leave. And for that, I was ever grateful. Um, I migrated to the States and we still kept contact. I remember us talking numerous amount of times for hours on the phone about our favorite team, Manchester United, and all that stuff, just life on a whole. Um, about, I'd say, um, yes, my birthday, I woke up and I messaged him, I said, happy birthday, brother. Um, he responded to me, saying, thank you, bro. And two days later, it was my birthday, I woke up to the same message. You know, words of encouragement, told me how much I was a fighter, how I must keep on fighting, you know, and he wished me a happy birthday. We spoke the night and I said to him, bro, when soon come Jamaica, and I said, well, may I have action over my, over my yard? You need to come, come check me. And we spoke at length about, you know, just coming to Jamaica and hanging out. And that was it. A few weeks later, I didn't hear anything from him. I messaged him, I never heard anything. Um, then I got the news from Tara. That um, yeah, he he was found and whatever the case may be. I started to pray immediately. I remember I was in Virginia, and I started to pray immediately because you know this was surprising and shocking to me. Um, I would always text her every day. Hey, Tara, what's going on? How still? Not hearing anything positive from her really she wants to say things are going coming on coming on but i never wanted to hear that i wanted to hear that he was out of the hospital and doing well um when i heard uh, the friday morning i was actually at dialysis and um tara messaged me saying that he's gone and i messaged her back and said gone where you know and um i think dre her husband confirmed with me that he died and I cried immediately. I honestly, my mind went back to so much interaction with the uh, camp, church, and a whole basketball, you know, so many interactions and things. And he brought me back to when he, even when his mother passed and I, you know, I, I was I was there. I was I was always there. Saka was always there. You know, and to be doing this tribute for my brother now, it's like, how is this even reality? 
But I garnered something from him. He was always encouraging. He always tried to encourage me, Saka, you're strong. You know, got a, got a plan for you and whatever the case may be. So I want to encourage those who are seeing this at the moment. You know, don't take it as um don't take it as a lost. Take it as motivation for us to get ourselves right. And with that being said, I will close out by saying this. You know, death will come and we will weep. But let's not weep in the, the reality of not knowing if we will make it. Let us weep because persons will go and people will pass. And, you know, that's just life. The human side of us will always keep that. But let us just be mindful that our this, our, 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 I'm all tied up for it. Let's just be mindful that, you know, the Lord is coming soon and let's just be ready. Thank you. Theodore Johnson, <clears throat> I still cannot bring myself to believe that you are no longer with us. Um, just the other day, I had sent you a message and I was just waiting for you to respond. Um, I never got that response. Um, how can someone so young, so promising, humble and loving be gone so soon? It took me several days to bring myself to do this tribute. And even so, I just cannot um, do exactly what I wanted to do because I kept breaking down. So I will just uh, speak from my heart. Theo uh, is, um, Theo was a gentle um, giant with a big heart. If you didn't know Theo and you saw him coming, you would probably think he was up to no good because he always had this perplexed look on his face. But as soon as he, his mouth opened and you heard, you know, all the stories, all the jokes and all the laughter, um, you know, that was it. You would just be into all that he has to say because, you know, all the theatrics and he always had some crazy story to tell. I met Theo at St. Anne's Bay SDA Church. <clears throat> I was so shy. I didn't really talk to anybody. And one day he just, you know, walked up and came to talk to me. And he said, I figure you one of them girls that don't talk to people like me, you know. I said, me? Poor me? You know, Sister Mishai, why would I not want to talk to you? <clears throat> Same time his mother, um, Mrs. Johnson, was walking by and she said hello and she said, tell me something. I've been meaning to ask you about that hairstyle when you have your hair in one. It's always lean to one side. And I said to her, Sister Johnson, if you ever know, every morning, no matter how I try, my hair lean to one side. She said, really? You know, I thought it was a style or something. And all three of us just bursted out last, laughing and the rest was just history. <clears throat> Theodore has been a good friend over the years. We always encouraged and pushed each other. Even in high school, he was going to your castle up the road and I was going to St. Hilda's. And at the end of school days, we would, you know, we would be waiting for our buses to come. Sometimes he'll come over and we'll talk. He'll show me some art that he did. And it was just, you know, a friendship that lasted for several years. As we grew older, um, it became, you know, us encouraging each other throughout our careers. Sometimes I might have a rough day at work or he might have a rough day at work and we just talk about it, you know, or about stories from back then. 
He drew the most amazing art pieces I've ever seen, but he was so humble. One thing that has brought me some comfort um, looking back at our messages was earlier this year when we were talking about the pandemic and all that was going on in this world and seeing some of it firsthand myself um, working on the front lines, I said, Theo Manala, it's sad and it depressing, but he said, and this is what he said to me, and I quote, I have faith in the Lord and that he will protect his children. So I am not afraid. His will will be done, end quote. That gave me, and I hope all of you, some relief that Theo was God-fearing. And if we live a life that is pleasing to God, we will one day see Theo again. Theo was a type of friend that was always there when everybody else had gone their way. Um, this year, I lost my brother, Kevin, weeks and months after the funeral, when most people had um, moved on with life. Theo reached out to me and it was just the perfect timing. We spoke for quite some time and even when I had no words, he knew exactly what to say as if he could somehow read my mind. Family and friends, let us keep Tara and Elder Johnson not just today but for the weeks and months to come because grieving never truly ends. Tara, Theo adored and loved you and Dom so much. You made him so proud. In fact, in most of, if not all of our conversations, um, you could just hear the joy in his voice when he talked about you. Elder Johnson, Theo looked up to you and loved his daddy beyond words. He hoped to be like you one day in so many ways. Theo may not be physically here with us, but his spirit lives on in the memories of those who loved him. Let us cherish the memories we have of Theo and keep them alive and in our hearts until we meet him again. Theo, thanks for being that friend who was always there through good or bad times. Thanks for sharing your stories, your art, your art your corny jokes sometimes, and your laughter. You made life that much sweeter and your presence will be deeply missed, a void that will never be filled again. Sleep in peace, my friend, until we meet again. Good morning all, I'm Tony, Fio's uncle from the UK back in England. Just got a couple of memories that stick out in my mind with Theo. And one of them was, I can remember back in 1999 when I came out with my sister and we came and visited you. And I remember lifting both of you up and took you to the shop and bought you a bag of sweets and you just laughed your heads off, you enjoyed that day. That was back in 1999. You've grown up since, because when I next saw you was in 2015. That wasn't a good day in itself, because we was here to bury your mother and my rock in a sister, Carmen. I truly believe Theo never got over the loss of his mother. And it was like, wow. How am I going to pick Theo up? Look how big he is. But I did try. I remember trying to pick him up on my mum's veranda. And it was a struggle. Theo was too big. His Theo was six foot ten. And then... We always used to love to talk football. Who am I going to have banter with now? Me in the blue corner, yourself in the red corner. We had many seasons trying to right the wrong and glorify the good in our teams. There was so much more we had to do together as a family. Now I'm going to have to meet you on the other side. 
So until such times, tall man, you are forever in my heart. Good morning, everyone. I am Sandra, Theo's auntie on his mother's side. Um, I've written a letter to my Theo, um, and here it is. I've known you for only 33 short years and the impact you have had is immense. I've come to know you as a gentle giant with a beautiful smile. Your words have always been thoughtful and considerate of others. I have looked at you in awe, so talented, making such beautiful art, artwork, and thinking, well, my nephew created that. Yeah. I am trying to come to terms with your passing but realise that I can choose to remember you as gone or cherish your memory and let you let it live on. I chose the latter knowing that one day we will meet again. Rest in peace, my beautiful nephew, Theo. Mm. Love, Auntie Sandra. Thank you, everyone. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Auntie Wendy, um, Tony's wife. Um, this message is for Theo. Just want to say I'm going to miss hearing your voice on match day, especially the derby. You're a big United fan, we're a big City fan. And um, we can't believe you're gone and it's never going to be the same. Our heart goes out to everyone in Jamaica. I wish we could all be there with you. Our arm, we're thinking of you and our hearts are with you all. Um, to Cousin Theo and Marley, um, I know we only ever met the once, but I know you won't be forgotten and I know to all the family out there in Jamaica, we'll be able to get through it because that's what we do in this family. To Cousin Theo, I'm Lee, sorry to hear you know, that you're no longer with us, you'll never be forgotten, you'll always remain in my heart and everyone else's heart and to the family in Jamaica, stay strong and I hope the day goes well and you have a you know, really good send off for Theo. Um, to Theo, I'm Lyric. Um, I only met you once, but um, we always spoke on the phone and on Instagram. I remember you for your art and how tall you were, and the family won't be the same without you, and we we'll all miss you dearly. Just want to thank those persons from Mario Pine, Denise of St. Fleur and Tony Garwood and family for those tributes to Theo. Um, I remember meeting Theo some time ago and my most recent experience was at Dominique's um, Baby Blessing. I remember, you know, having utmost admiration for him, at least about 98% of what I experienced was admiration. I think there was about 2% bad mind because, you know, when I look at him, I, s I see where God could have given me a little more height. And also, I mean, I'm sure Pastor can share the same sentiment, wish, you know, that I could have a full head of hair, you know, at that age. Um, you know, so it was a little disappointing for me knowing that, you know, those blessings were available, but he got so much more than some of us Pastor. Um, but we also were able to experience a lot from him. And so we celebrate that continually. You know, he used to play a lot of basketball, and I, we, have, we share that in common where he would play and I would watch basketball. And um, I don't know if you play basketball, Pastor. So we, we are on the watching side, while Theo was on the playing side. You know, so we just want to, you know, celebrate him for so many things that he's been a part of. And so as we continue in this celebration of life, we're going to have Praise Circle again doing a wonderful tribute in song. And then follow, following that, we'll have the Suns basketball team, the Gleaner Company, Andrew Franklin, friend, Mikhail Deere from the Ken Cod Seventh-day Adventist Church, and then Keneal Allen, friend, teammate, and co-worker. So long I've searched for life's meaning and so by the world and my grief, then the door of my 
Make you know, sir, why you miss him. You miss him big time. I love and respect him all the time. Sons all in, all the way. Yeah, man, brother. Brother, to you, I'm not telling you, like, brother. I'm get the news, brother. I'm going to believe you, because I know, so, you know, last time you said they are command and thing, you know, you're gone right and all. So, you just have to just accept, so you are part of life. Sad, but God need you for your next mission. So, do you think, my brother? Rest in peace. Rest up. Rest up. Just continue to watch over me. And we will continue to play ball and keep you there. Go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. Rest up here. You don't know the things set in a brother. Boy, we know it go. Life it is, but one step at a time. You don't know. SSL for life. Yeah, T, you big of yourself, you. We miss the humility and thing. And that's why you do a part of life, but you know you're good. 
Yung mga good PS4 na. Big up yourself, kilo ni Dragon. Out. Tiyo. Ano? <clears throat> One of the most humblest you ever know. You know? And the week before, you're sick out and thing. You did have play ball or have a good time. Get the news, couldn't believe it. And the plan was for all of us as a team come together and help you with the recuperation and thing. And then we get another news, say, uh, a drop out. So. Part of life, as the whole other man, them know, you know, journey come to an end, but we know, say, every day I watch over, we see him. Zimmy, condolences to the family. And we day I see him here. Strength, you know, strength, part of life. Hard to accept, but you have to accept it. It's gift thanks, is it? I'm going to watch over it. Yo, yeah, big brother, you're yeah, But they are man, and I don't really accept this. I don't know if I ever will accept it. Or anyhow, we will accept it. You know, but um, God knows best. In God, we always trust Him know why all things happen, you know why things don't happen. You know, you're dead with your moms, you know, you miss her, you know, she miss you. You know, so just go and watch over the family, just go and watch over your sons, brother. We're there. And through this, we will always draw strength through all adversity. Sons for life, brother. Not now, got change. This will never stop. It only ever get bigger and better. We all look forward to see you one day. So, just rest till we see you again. One day. Ah. Theo, um, uh, I, I had a lot to say. I don't have to say anymore, but I love you. You are missed. And um, every now and then, God sends persons, angels around us to show us how we can be or we should be and makes us want to be that way and I honestly believe that you are one of those persons that God has put into our lives and I think of you when I speak about you I speak about you in the present tense because that's how impactful you are to us all so we love you, we miss you and with God's grace, we'll all be together again. Take care of us. We'll continue to pray for you. Take care of your moms. We'll take care of you. And just know that we miss you and love you. Sons for life. Take care, bro. Family members, friends, and well wishers of Theodore, on behalf of the boards and our directors in the group, on behalf of the management, I want to express our heartfelt sympathies to you on the loss of your loved one, our friend and colleague, Theodore. I didn't know Theodore personally apart from seeing him play basketball on behalf of our group. But for all those who knew him and the outpouring of love that we saw when he fell ill and since his passing, it tells us how special a person he was to so many of our staff members and our colleagues. Indeed, I've seen managers cry so often when they look back at things to do with you that it says he did make a significant impact, even at such a young age, on many in our group. We are sorry about his passing. We extend our condolences and we hope that he will have eternal rest. Theodore Johnson, a co-worker, sportsman, brother and friend. Theo, as he was affectionately called by all who interacted with him, stood tall, not only in stature, but in his commitment to his responsibilities, as was displayed in his work ethics and his attitude, whether it was on the computer or on the court. He was a valuable member of the RG Arduino Communications Business House basketball team where he played defense. And he contributed significantly to the team's accomplishments 
over the past seven years. Theo joined the cleaner company in 2013 as a graphic artist in the advertising department. And in 2019, he moved to the editorial department where he served as a sub-editor until that fateful day, September 3, 2021. His co-workers and friends described him as being affable, dependable, and cooperative. One colleague awarded to Theo the top award for being the easiest person with whom to work. His personality exuded humility and respect for all. And perhaps these characteristics are what we will remember most about Theo and will make him live on in our memories as an exemplary co-worker and an exemplary employee. We were saddened when we learned of his passing but we are happy for the moments and the times we spent with him. They will always remain pleasant memories for us. He will surely be missed. The angels in heaven have received him with open arms. They're rejoicing. Perhaps they needed a defense player. We express condolences to his father and his sister and the rest of the family. Rest in peace, Theo. We will meet you on the other side. It is with deep sadness and a profound sense of loss that I pay tribute today to Theo, our tall, hardworking, easygoing, optimistic team player in the editorial department. Since I joined the Gleaner two years ago, Theo was one of those persons that I always felt I could depend on. He was oftentimes the last person I would see when I left the department at nights. And every conversation I've had with him since joining the company has been nothing but pleasant. I've never heard him angry. I've never heard him say no. In fact, Theo was always willing to go above and beyond the call of duty. And even when you had to correct him on occasion about something he'd done, he took it in stride and was always seemingly willing to grow and to learn. We will miss his cooperative and gentle spirit. May he rest in peace and rise in glory. Sincerest condolences to all his family and friends. And please take comfort today in the fact that I think Theo is playing a game of basketball with Kobe Bryant and smiling down all of us from heaven. What good Theo. We love you and we miss you. I remember Theo. I always saw Theo. He was hard to miss because he was so tall. I clearly remember our first conversation. It happened in the Gleaner Company's lunchroom long before the pandemic. I was always defending my personal space, even when standing in a line. I was at the front of the line making my order and the person behind me was literally breathing down my neck. I turned and gave the look. Theo saw the look and I clearly remember his words. Just dress back my youth. Theo was kind. He often came to work with fruits, lots of fruits, and he did not mind sharing. Sometimes he would announce heading to lunch because he knew he might be able to help one of us. I always felt Theo. He would come in office and touch all of us closest to him on the shoulder saying, Medea, when we started working remotely, he would sign on to the messenger with, Seanette, Medea, I'm ready for work. I could talk God things with Theo. No topic was taboo. He was unsure why God allowed his mom to rest so early, but he loved and trusted God nevertheless. He was one of a few who really understood my grief when my dad passed in April. Boy, Sean, let me understand. Hang in there, he said. He would say to me, just pray about it, I mean, we pray about it. 
and often our jo joke, especially at lunchtime, was, Sean it, how that look like that thing they saw? And my reply would be, no swine round here, and we would laugh. Theo was honest. If my design was off, I would hear, something all right they saw. If it was the opposite, I knew what he meant when he said, get them Sean it. I am missing and will miss Theo. Reliable, friendly, kind, quiet, loyal Theo. With his ever so bright smile and facial expressions that made me laugh. Theo, who would check to see if I'm okay. I will miss Theo. But I take comfort in the promise of the ever-living one that if I hold fast to him, I'll see Theo on that day. Until that day, rest my friend. Rest. At the thought of paying tribute to Theodore on the occasion of his funeral, I was at a loss, flustered really as to what to say, and afraid that my words would not do him justice, because there are so many things to say. But then I remember that he always approached life in a calm, measured manner, taking his time to get what he needed to do done. This is the approach I chose to use today. I will never be able to capture the essence of who Theodore was in just a few minutes, but I can share a few of my fondest memories of the person I knew him to be. When you work us closer together and at the intense pace that we do, mere acquaintances become friendships and friendships soon turn to kinship. It was the same with us and Theodore. When we lost him on that fateful September 3, we didn't just lose a colleague, we lost a brother. For two weeks prior, we held our collective breath as we prayed for a miracle that this unexpected illness that had befallen him would pass just as quickly as it came. But even if not quickly, then at least eventually, so that we could get back to life as it had been. It was not to be. Our prayers couldn't keep him here with us, but we hope they helped to carry him safely home. Without knowing it, Theo often reminded me of things we often forget in the everyday hustle and bustle of life, like how to appreciate the simple things. I would assign him a page that he loved to do, and he would say, bless you, Ten, and express so much joy at being given the opportunity to do it. Reactions like those would always give me pause and cause me to slow down, take a breather and contemplate the simple things. That's what Thea was to me, a quiet, calming force. Sometimes while I was working on a feature, seemingly out of the blue, he would say to me, why you do me that? And I'd be at a loss as to what I did. And he would say, you mean you really do all the pages and not even give me one? And when I'd explain about rushing to meet the deadline, he would always say, but you never try me. You should try my man. And I would assure him that next time I would. And he would say, me still vex, but all right. Theo would always do his best with whatever he was working on, sometimes teetering dangerously close to missing deadlines. And when I'd point out that fact, he would say, 10. I fear this enough, you know me now let you down. And at night before he signed off, he'd say, Ten, it looked like I made that enough. And I'd say, thank you, Theo, I appreciate you so much. And he would always say, no, man, that at the least. But for me, that was the most, to see his commitment to his job and his craft. We lost a brilliant artist, an all-round decent young man. Someone who was never above correction and who took everything in a dignified manner. So to Theo I say, some things you don't expect so you're never prepared. And when they happen, they knock the wind out your sails. This was perhaps the last thing I expected. And in every quiet moment when the reality hits me anew, my whole heart hurts. I'm glad I said what I needed to say while you were here. You knew I loved and appreciated you and your approach to work and to life. So I don't have regrets about things left unsaid, 
But I do regret that you couldn't stay longer. We all really wanted you to. You left a trail of broken hearts behind. The memories are all we have now. Thanks for touching our lives in the positive ways you did. You were the coolest, the gentlest, the most awesome. Rest with the angels, Theo. So, basically, Theo and I, I have been friends for many years. Yeah, I can't even keep a check on the time. It has been that long. But it is that to me has still been a surprise. And we all know we have lost a very dear friend. And to his family members, a very dear family. But it, it goes without saying that he is always, are, they are always in a better place. And now I can say he's with his mommy. She, I don't think she'd have wanted him this soon, but he's there nevertheless. So Theo was this jovial person. And that's, that's so typical to even say jovial. Theo, Theo was different. Theo was different. And Theo talks a lot. So, because of his personality, Theo tends to have people gravitate towards him very easily. The few might not, the few that doesn't take on to him is barely a handful. Most persons I know who met Theo and talked to him often end up liking him. But for the most part though, that was a dude, believe me. Whenever we have one-on-one -on -one together with, with me and him. It would definitely be a whole broad topic. Most times though, we talk about relationships, family, and friends, and even things happening now with these youngsters. But for what is worth though, he is missed. He will be missed. He is missed. And he's a dear friend to me. It's just puzzling the way he had departed this hurt though. And it's somewhat confusing to me and maybe to a, a lot of other persons as well. But I just want to say this dude, this person will always be remembered. Always will be remembered. If not by all, by most. And it took me a while to even come to terms with it. And even now, even talking about it, it feels like it is still alive because most times I find myself going upstairs <clears throat> and normally peeping through the corridor where I could see him, from, see, him, see him from the lobby. I could stay in the lobby, see him sitting at his desk. And I still often do, do that not remembering that he's not here with us anymore. But, Tio, big up yourself. Big up yourself. Good afternoon, everyone. Stopped writing 10 years ago. When they feel, could I get my back to do it? There's a thought I keep having, and it's a beautiful one. It's the realization that we're all each other's photo album. Like carrying videos and snapshots in the back of our minds' pockets. And if, you, if the mood is right, you don't have to try hard to unlock it. In our quiet moments, they bombard the backs of our eyelids like silent movies on a screen. Some sweet, some bitter, some strange, and you don't remember what they mean. Marley was right when he said, the good times of today are the sad thoughts of tomorrow, because Bob knew that for every smile cracked, every grin shared, every hug had, and every laugh chuckled, the horizon held sorrow. Theo was a flash of light, 
fear was a flash of color in a sea of black and white. The way the world kept turning after he left still doesn't feel right. So I take refuge in the rememberings of yesterday. Like, I remember our trip to Montego Bay and we met this cute girl there. The plan was to tell jokes and stories all day and hopefully one of us would get her number. Neither of us was brave enough to ask. I remember nights he'd stay at my dorm room after we'd be at UA Carnival. I remember how he stooped whenever he stepped into my house. I remember how every time he hugged my sister, her head would barely reach his chest. I remember the evening walks on the scheme, the hours long talks under my manga tree, plotting out what moves we were going to be making in life. I remember his booming laugh, this larger than life figure. I remember his honesty in expressing how he felt. Never failing to be his authentic self, unabashed, unadulterated, undiluted, and concentrated Theo. These are some of my snapshots on my videos. Relive the past times, and I encourage you all to do the same and to share. Mourn the fact that he's gone, but be grateful that he was here. Thank you. Theodore Johnson, Theo Tallman. I stand before you this afternoon to bring you, to you tribute on behalf of the Kencott SDA family, but more specifically, on behalf of a group of friends that Theo would hang out with every time he comes to Kencott. These are Kadai Ligna, who is sitting around the back right now, his wife, Anika Ligna, Adrian Bailey, Kadeen Sr., Latoya Kennedy, Kirk Morris, and Lerone Byfield. To be honest, I cannot recall to you the day that Theo first entered into our lives, but it literally feels like he's been around forever. We shared countless memories together trips, football games, Sabbath lunches, you name it. Amongst the name I've listed earlier, Kadeen Sr. remembers Theo as being jovial, humble, someone who you could hold a good conversation with, a family man, and someone who loved art and could draw very well. Adrian said he was always encouraging and saw him as a brother, saw him as family. To Anika, he was a true friend. For me, Theo is always among the life of whatever social gathering we were having. He had a big and infectious laugh. He could talk up a storm. <laughs> It's never a dull moment with Theo, and I particularly like his animated way of expressing himself. To give you an example, one night after playing football at Kencott, yeah, Theo played football too, not as good as he played basketball, but he would dabble. He had a very descriptive slow motion <laughs> um, body check highlight of um, what happened in the game. A player named Grimm sort of body checked him. <laughs> Grimm wasn't as tall as Theo, but he was a big guy, big in body. Um, he, to look at him, he's quite a few inches over six feet, and he was maybe on the chubby side. And I'll try to do this as best as I can. But after the game, we huddle, and you know, we 
do our own analysis of the game. And that evening, I remember Grimm was solid in defense, you know? And he'll say at one point, the ball went over his head and he turned around. <laughs> and that was Grimm. Grimm didn't have on any shirt. We had skins and shirt, you know? And he was well in the game, so Grimm was sweaty and, you know, <laughs> well in the game. And Grimm jumped ahead the ball and that was steel face crashing into Grimm. Theo said, the man of man boobs bridging. <laughs> but what I admired most about Theo was his unreserved affection. He wasn't afraid to tell you how much he respected you for something you did or just for who you are. He wasn't afraid to tell you how much he valued the friendship. He showed concern and doesn't hesitate to ask if you're okay. He was a genuine person and always showed himself, always. I remember another time when we did the Digicel 5K night run together. Theo beat me, by the way. <laughs> um, I went with two young ladies and we met up there. But after the race, Theo, I live fairly close to Theo and Theo rode with us home. Right after introducing Theo to the ladies, it's like the rest was history. He had them laughing and chatting up the whole trip to his house. And that's just the type of person that Theo was. I was devastated when I heard of Theo's passing, especially because we haven't spoken until, well, since mid-July of, of this year. He was in the hospital and I didn't know. Before that, we had sporadic conversations um, during all of COVID and sometime before. I haven't seen Theo. And I know he would agree with me for saying this but we need to keep in touch with our friends and families um, is really the message that I want to leave with you. Life is too short. As my brother said to me this morning, you know, it's very fragile. We really have to keep in touch with those that we love and cherish. Let them know how much we care about them while they are here on earth. Rest in peace, Theo. You'll always be remembered. Good morning, everyone. They have to adjust the mic like Theo, but not as tall as Theo. Um, my name is Kenny Allen. Um, I met Theo at a Dina company uh, in, I think, 2011, they're about. And um, saw him in other times, didn't think much of him, but I remember there was basketball season going on. And uh, the, the year when I started, I wasn't eligible to play uh, because I started Gleena when the competition was already started. So, we had to wait another year uh, for the beginning of the, the other season to, for us to be eligible to play. And um, I remember Theo and I, we started the same year for that team, for the Gleaner team. And we started, you know, we, we told ourselves that we are going to be the difference makers. We are going to be the one that bring a championship to, to Gleena. And uh, I remember at the time when we started, uh, you know, just going to training and just seeing Theo, this tall guy. I've, I don't think I've ever played somebody that tall, <laughs> you know, because I was coming out of high school straight into, you know, the working world. And I saw Theo, I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I was always competitive. So, you know, play, Theo wanted to play me defense because he had me as one of the better players on the team. And so he made it his point of duty to guard me, you know, and because of my competitive nature, I'm like, I'm going to show you that you can't guard me. <laughs> you know, and Theo, Theo will do everything. And I'm like, all right, 
Alright, yeah, do your thing, man. <laughs> yeah, play some defense. And um, I think from that day on, you know, we became, you know, the close research other in the, the walkway at work, we hail each other. Um, I remember the beginning of the first season, coach um, Ted, you know, he was choosing his, his, his three on three, so he wanted to, he was choosing his top three players to start the games. Um, you know, I made the top three, he was coming off the bench. There was this other tall guy. He was really good as well, but um, he played like about two games with us and he went to a new job. So Theo got that position to start um, on the team and I could see how excited Theo was. It, it felt like, you know, for him, it was just a great honor to, to be named a starting player on a team. And so Theo took that with so much pride. You know, Theo was the ultimate team player. Uh, Theo wasn't the, the best at scoring the ball. <laughs> and he knew that. So he stick to his strength, and, which was to play defense. And one thing Theo would say, yeah, don't worry about it, man. Me play defense for you. Just go score the ball. Theo would always say, me play defense. Just go score the ball. Okay, don't worry about it. And so I remember that first year we, uh, we played... Uh, 19 games in the regular season. We won all 19 games. We went to the playoffs. Won all the games in the playoffs. Uh, went to the finals. We won the, we won the finals. We lost one game. You know, and even that one game, it wasn't even Theo's fault, but he took it on himself that maybe that it was a mistake he made there, that mistake he made there. Um, but we won the championship, and that was such a good feeling. You know, and Theo, you could see just the you know, the excitement on his face to win something, you know, how appreciative he was and just to be a part of something special. And so Theo, you know, fast forward, you know, we play on teams and the Gleaner team, you know, had some really tough years. We couldn't win a match. <laughs> you know, we moved up to, to Division 1 because we won Division 2. But Theo remained positive. Theo was one of those teammates he would always encourage, don't worry about it, man, you got to score the next one. But it was so ironic, Theo was so hard on himself. <laughs> you know, Theo missed a catch, missed a shot, he feel like he should have scored. Theo would be so hard on himself. And, um, you know, I'd always try to encourage him. Say, no, man, we'll keep your head up. The next play, you get it the next time. And um, Theo, I, I saw over the years he tried to work on keeping his head up after a mistake or, you know, missing a shot or reading the play wrong or allowing his team, the, the other defender, the other person, the other team to score on him. And I see it was so encouraging. Always, always. No, no, worry about it, man. No, worry about it, man. You got to get it, man, next time, Ken, Ken. <laughs> you know? And um, I remember throughout the years, um, players have left, uh, I guess, to go to work to other places, some migrated. But it was always Theo, myself, and, and Raymond remained on the team. And so even uh, season after season, we would be the first three to show up to training, first persons to register. We will be at the, the official meetings. And so we formed this brother, you know, this brotherhood bond, and so, me, um, Theodore, Raymond, and myself, we'll be everywhere together, everywhere together. And so, uh, with, with, with Raymond, I know it's not the one to want to talk much, but I can <laughs> share for him. Raymond uh, will always drop him home, especially after work. Um, you know, Glenna have some real late shifts. Theo would be the one of those person who would walk from work to home. And it is not a close distance, you know. And at the time, Theo had a bus. And I always said, Theo, why you don't drive to work? I, I don't get it. I no, man, exercise is good for me, man. Or about it, man. But all right. And Theo would walk to work some days and walk back home. And I would be puzzled. i like, Theo, why don't you take your vehicle? And Theo was just, just that humble for him. It is nothing for him to walk. You know, um, it's nothing for him to take a taxi one day and to park the bus. Um, but 
Raymond would assist in dropping him home a lot of times. Uh, I remember after training, we'll be very hungry, tired. <laughs> and so me, Raymond, and Thea going home. I remember one time um, I brought dinner, big container, and I pulled it out of the bag after training. And Thea looked for me and said, you alone are going to eat that dinner? <laughs> and Raymond like, yeah, what you doing? You alone can't eat that. And I remember just the three of us, uh, we, we ate it, you know, we had a good conversation. We talk about the upcoming season. We talk about, you know, just expectations and how we want to win a, another championship. I remember the first feeling of winning that first one. And again, Theo was just one of those persons. Again, he can be so hard on himself, but yet so encouraging to others. Um, that stuck out to me the most about um, Theo. Always encouraging never passing in place with anybody, um, never rude to anybody. He firmly believed in justice, firmly believed in treating people right. Um, somebody, again, I've never met that had so much strong morals and values and he stuck by it. No matter what he had experienced in life, Theo was resolute in doing the right things. And, and I'm not just saying it, you know, because it's the right thing to say, but Theo was always like that, it's the truth. Theo was always like that. You know, Theo always claims him look up to me as a, as a human being. I'm saying, no, oh, bro, you're a better man than me because, you know, <laughs> in instances where I would probably get upset, Theo would always encourage me and say, no, man, don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And uh, we will have conversations on the phone uh, I remember there was a time when I started going to university. Um, Theo volunteered his time. Theo said that he wanted to help the team to train because he wanted us to win. And Theo will leave work. The thing is that um, our training will start like 7 p.m. in the night. So Theo will leave from work about like 7.30, 8 o'clock. Theo will come to Micah training. He's not a part of the team. Theo will um, he'll arrive to training, change, do his laps. No laps was required of him. But Theo wants to do his laps like he's a part of the team, uh, run the plays as well. And Theo will even sometimes um, come to the matches with us. So there are games where we'll have matches in different parishes, like in St. Anne, in Manchester. And Theo will try his best to be there because he wants to see the team um, to be successful. And so Theo was so encouraging even to the young men and the, the Micah team and they look up to him um, to the point where he has developed so much good, so much good friendship with them. Um, I can call a few names like Tommy McDonald, um, Leslie Castle, Fabian Sutherland, um, Jason Walker, uh, just to name a few. Uh, Theo, became a brother to them. See you, uh, even when the training is over and we finish training about like 10 o'clock sometimes, you know? And we'll be, you know, a bit livid because we want to go home and we're thinking about class the next day. See you uh, will ensure that he drove his bus that day to, to training and dropped home everybody. That was see you. Uh, see you, uh, nobody not at the bus. And all of us live different places, especially for me, I lived in Portmore at the time. So you can imagine Theo is dropping me from Kingston this after 10 to Portmore and to, to get back home. And when he's home, give me a text, reach home, brother. I said, oh, bro, respect. And um, Theo was just that type of person, always selfless, putting himself, puts others before himself. Um, there's so much stuff I could say about Theo, but time would not permit, <laughs> you know, and uh, even my words, no, I don't think it's giving justice to the amazing human being Theo was, you know, people call him the, lit the gentle giant. Theo was a superhero, you know, he was a superhero. He had so much impact on persons um, throughout just the basketball community in Jamaica, and um, Theo will be forever missed. Um, I don't know. I'm going to definitely miss those talks. I remember the last real conversation I had with him. 
it was uh, on a Wednesday. I uh, just started a new job. So he uh, uh, messaged me, sent me a voice note, and he was saying, yo, when we can meet again, when we can link? Because the month before, we met up with one of my other close friends. We went to Devon House, we bought food, and we talked, and we laughed. You know, and still said, yo, I could try to do this at least once a month, because he loved just the, the camaraderie and the conversations. And so he messaged me, and he said, bro, when we can do this again, because I don't want these meetings to be spaced out. So I said to him, you know, as soon as possible, bro. I mean, I just started working. Um, and I said to him, as soon as possible, I will contact my other friend and we set a date and we make it, make it happen. Fast forward, that was a Wednesday, the Sunday, um, Raymond called me about Kalina trying to reach out to him, not getting through to him. And I tried to reach out to him, uh, didn't get any response. So I reached out to Tara. And uh, you know, Tara with a quick response went to the to the apartment and they found him and rushed him to the hospital. And so when he was there, I dropped everything. Uh, Tara told me where they was and I dropped everything. That was a Sunday night. And I went there and um just the state that he was in was, you know, a bit depressing and sad to me because I've never seen Thea down apart from you know, his mom, you know, he loved his mom so much. Always talking about his mom, you know, always wishing that she was still around. Um, I was wanting to be the best for her, you know, and uh, you know, I'd always encourage him to, you know, live a life like she's here, you know, that she can be proud of you. And she uh, always tried to do the right things, you know, what would his mom think of him? And so, um, when I was at the hospital, I was there the Sunday and, I, and the Monday. And I remember the last time I saw Sia was that Monday. And I was praying with him. The son's group, uh, they sent a bunch of prayers in the, in the group and they said that I should play it for him so he could hear it. And a few other guys sent prayers in the group and Sia listened to it and Sia nodded his head and saying amen. Um, and I remember the, I prayed for him. This was the last thing I did before I left. I prayed for him and uh, a friend of mine was there too as well. Um, a former coworker, Nada was there and she prayed for him as well. And when I finished praying for him, I said, Theo, it is well, it is well. And Theo looked at me and said, it is well with my soul. And those were the last words um, I heard Theo said. Um, really was looking forward to, you know, help him on that, you know, rehab journey. Uh, we had so much plans. Um, Raymond and I, we spoke about all the things that we would have done to help Theo on this recovery journey. Um, I don't know. Theo, I think we can call him a friend. He was a, a brother to me. He was a brother to many uh, males in Jamaica, um, in the basketball community. He was the epitome of humility, um, epitome of just wanting to see people love you, miss you, and definitely see you again. Thank you. Mr. Tyra Monroe and Father Anthony Johnson who complete this wonderful picture for us to be able to see in fullness the beauty, the beauty of Theo's life. So we'll sing How Great Thou Art together. Stars, I hear the rolling thunder. 
Then sings my soul, then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art. And when I look, and when I look down from lofty mountain grandeur, and hear the brook, and feel the gentle breeze, everyone now then, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee, how great Thou art. How great thou art, then sings, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when, and when I think that God his Son not sparing, sent him to die I scarce can take it in that on a cross that on the cross my burden gladly hearing he bled and died to take away my sins everyone now then then sings my soul my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. Last verse, when Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow, then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim. God, how great thou art. Let's sing this last verse. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. How great thou art. Then sings, let's sing together. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Hallelujah. Let me say good afternoon to all. A very sad occasion. 
But I just want to use this time out to say thank you all for being a part of this. My son, Tara's brother, a really sad occasion, but for you to be here, it brings comfort to our hearts. And so, we are just going to share who Theodore was, and I might say is, because he has impacted our lives uh, tremendously. And so, as we share, it is our intent that you, as you listen, you will accept as we go. And I just want to use this time out. I know that everybody is here and what have you, but I want to recognize a very good friend of mine, Earl, is visiting with me. I did not know that he will be here from Connecticut. And there he's sitting there, and I want to salute you, my friend. You are a friend indeed. He came and is here with us and is part of this proceeding. And so I'll, without further ado, I'll allow Tara to start, and we will interject as we go. Thank you. Good afternoon. Quote, true happiness comes from God. Prove me wrong, end quote, Theodore Johnson. Theodore Johnson, the gentle giant. I honestly can't believe I'm doing a eulogy for Theo. Did this six years ago? Come on, me. And you know, you foolishly think that you're done with the whole dying thing with your family members, but that's not how life is. Dying is a part of life and at any time. But you know, before I even read the actual eulogy, when mommy passed away, Theodore and daddy and I, we just got really close. We got extremely close. We had a family group. We just became like this three link unit. And you never really think that one of us is going to drop out. And believe me, when I say Theodore is the last person I thought about to leave us. He was my first friend and an arch nemesis at the same time growing up. From the occasional shoves to the ground from behind our living room furniture as I walked by, or to being an informer on me, telling mommy and daddy about the things I did wrong. The love, though very quirky, was there. Yeah. Born on a Sabbath morning, July 16th, 1988, right before Sabbath school, baby Theo blessed the household of Austin and Carmen as their firstborn child. And as Star mentioned there, that Theodore came in at 9.15 for us in, the, in this uh, congregation. We start Sabbath school at 9.15 <laughs> on a Saturday morning. So for Theodore to be born in time for Sabbath school, <laughs> it was very, uh, I was elated. I was becoming a daddy for the very first time. And I was just thanking God. I remember seeing you went through tremendous pain. But the, 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 just the fact that Theodore came into the world and I'm now a daddy, I, I mean, it was joyful. It was elated. And so we were grateful. I heard my parents always wanted a boy first. And a healthy baby boy is what they got, born at nine and a half pounds. He was the biggest baby at the hospital at that time. So we could say that even from then, he was setting the precedence. And uh, might I say here that I remember sitting in that hallway, uh, a few other men were with, with me, and um, each child that was, has been born on that morning, uh, they would say, oh, but my son is eight pounds, or my child is nine pounds. And when Theodore arrived, he was nine and a half. And I said, listen, you guys need to shut up. I am the, the champion. 
And so we were, again, happy for his being in this new world. Mommy and Daddy loved having Theo as their baby. They enjoyed the new light he brought into their home. They loved this new light so much that they were willing to do anything to protect it. I'm very certain that most persons here remember Hurricane Gilbert, that 1988 devastating hurricane that um, pretty much destroyed a lot of Jamaica. And um, if anyone remembers that hurricane, you'd remember, as I said, how scary it was, how destructive it was. And as new parents, they had to think quickly, so they did what they saw fit. They put baby Theo in a drawer to pr protect him while they hid under the bed as the hurricane passed. And folks, believe it or not, it worked. And so as Star mentioned about us having Theodore in a drawer, this was my first experience also to experience a, a, a hurricane that was coming full brunt. And uh, again, remember Theodore was our first child. He was born uh, in, in July and the storm came in September. So you're talking about a two month span as it were. And when that storm came and we saw what was happening, I remember looking through the window and some roof was just taking flight. And what we, we thought to do at the time was to just hide him or to keep him into a drawer, pull the drawer out, make a padding for it, and put him there. And to see that he was secured through the storm because we were adamant that we weren't going to lose our boy in the storm. Let's flash forward now to two years later when I arrived on the scene. I received a proper welcome from Theo. Uh, he was protective over me, I heard, and a helpful big brother I would have obviously been too young to remember. I can't explain it, but there was something about having an older brother as I grew that I really, really, really loved. It's a great feeling. Theodore and I used to share one bedroom from kindergarten to prep school, and without fail, every single night, I started the night in my bed and woke up the next morning in his bed. I don't know why, but I just took comfort in that. His bed just always looked way better than mine and felt way better, and I thought that whatever monster would attack me at night would change its mind once it saw my brother, who was my protector. Now, please note, he would often try to kick me out of this bed um, quite a few times, but he couldn't get rid of me. I was there, and I wasn't going anywhere. That feeling is a feeling I carried into adulthood. I always loved the idea of having my tall big brother around. Now, a lot of persons have a big brother, but a tall big brother is different, I'm sorry. So, I don't know, there was just something about Theodore's height. And you know, that was a precedent I even set for myself. I said, come Theodore, stand up beside me, and let me see how tall you are when I wear heels. And he was still taller than me if I had heels on. So I said, well, my husband has to be tall because I'm not going to give him my heels. So um, I'd use him to practice for things like that. But I always used to just admire his height. No matter if Tedder is in Mobey and I'm in St. Anne, I don't know, just knowing I have a tall brother somewhere, I just always felt safe. Um, the usual sibling rivalry, of course, was there um, between us. So we weren't like the perfect Brady Bunch or anything like that. Uh, I remember once my parents went to church one night, I think it was a Wednesday night meeting or a Sunday night meeting, and they left us home. Theo, I think maybe it was 12 at the time and I was 10. And I don't know what the fight was about that night, but I remember Theo brought me into the bathroom and held me upside down over the toilet and threatened me that he was going to dunk my head because of the trouble I was giving. And he came pretty close and he started to call me a plunger. And I figured that the only way I could get free was to bite him on his thigh. And that's what I did. And as mommy and daddy came through the door, he informed on me that out of the blue, I just bit him on his thigh. He didn't tell them that I held, he held me over the toilet seat. And that's when I realized the power of his height. So I decided not to mess with him anymore after that. Yeah. Ironically though, Though he would use his height over me at times, he would also stick up for me 
whenever I was in trouble. So it was kind of confusing because he would inform on me and then if daddy especially would get too angry, he would be the one in between <laughs> trying to protect me. So um, that was him. Theo had a true creative spirit and gift and I'm very grateful to my parents for enrolling us into different activities growing up as we try to find our different niches. Theo, though, from very early, always knew exactly what he wanted to do and what he didn't want to do, so you couldn't force him to do what he didn't want to do. So for example, he was rolling karate classes during prep school, and he quit classes by the first week because he just didn't want to do it anymore. Mommy actually found his karate gear in the trash, in the rubbish, he was just done. And can I um, interject here in that um, I remember we buying that karate clothing for Theodore. That was very expensive because the school was providing the same and uh, we had to pay for it. And Theodore not liking karate. Uh, and we are there telling him that he needs to be a part of it. And he just dumped the thing. He don't want to be a part of it and that closes it. He doesn't want it, don't force him, leave him alone. Well, he also tried sports, and he quickly realized that also wasn't his thing. This was still prep school. Whenever he realized that something was a waste of time to him, he went no further. But art had yes. a different impact. So at Columbus Prep, they, of course, exposed us to art classes very young. And art made Theo come alive. There was just something about art and graphics from that time that really was special to him. I became so used to seeing his pieces around the house, on his bedroom door, things like that. I'm not sure when the interest was birthed, but I know he thrived so unbelievably well in that area. I looked up to my big brother so much that I also tried my hand, but I, of course, was not as good as Theo. Um, but before I continue, I'll set another precedence by saying, in most households, it's customary for the wash belly to get the special treatment, right? That was not the case in the Johnson home at all. I remember, for example, when it was time for Theo to the GSAT, uh, which is now called PEP, and he wowed everyone by achieving acceptance into his first choice, York Castle High School. And I distinctly remember mommy and daddy creating this one bag of excitement when he came home, they jump in the car, beeping, waking up the whole scheme, it was one celebration. And all the neighbors heard the good news. Everybody came out to congratulate Theo. And mommy and daddy topped it off by taking him to dinner at Spring Garden Restaurant, this popular restaurant in St. Anne. It, a very expensive restaurant in St. Anne. It was it, like a full celebration. It was a motivation, really, because notice Star saying that Theodore um, liked doing hard. And so most of his time was used doing all of these things. Uh, the moment he gets that spare time, as it were, he will be drawing and he will be putting those stuff wherever he wants to place them. So for Theodore now to select his first choice for high school and, and um, eventually got through for there, you can understand why we are celebrating. So it was more so of a motivation that, listen, you have um, arrived, as it were, and we were celebrating. Well, that motivation was not passed on to me. <laughs> I was observing at the time, and I was liking what I was seeing, and I liked it so much that I couldn't wait for my turn two years from the time so that I could pass on my first choice in GSAT and to be taken to Spring Garden to eat. That never happened. So I, be I believe that that time will become broke. So one can understand. I'm just thankful that we have understanding children. So when that did happen, they did understand. Well, flash forward to Theodore's graduation from York Castle. Again, there was dinner provided at the end of the night to celebrate his achievements. And uh, my graduation came two years later. I stayed home and I watched TV. I cannot overemphasize, overemphasize how important our family makeup is in that they do understand these children they understand us perfectly well <laughs> and so we were <laughs> anyway
Looking back though, I actually wouldn't change a thing. I, I particularly knew why my parents were so encouraging of Theodore in particular. Um, because um, his friend Kenny was saying earlier, Theodore was hard at himself many times. So uh, he needed things like that for motivation. Theodore wanted me there also to celebrate with him. So um, I think he was very deserving of the things he received. And I think little things like that made him cherish family togetherness more than anything. Yes. And he understood how to celebrate other people's achievements. So he was never that person where if you achieve something, bad man and no, that's not Theo. He would even more celebrate you more than you're celebrating yourself. That's how yeah. theater was. He knew how to celebrate other people and I think that was a very admirable trait. As I said earlier, theater did art in, sorry, art in high school, but it was not until he went to Edna Manley College that he truly felt at home. He finally began to find other people who were creative just like him and who liked the same things at him, as him. At this point, I started to experience a different Theo, a Theo who really looked out for his little sister. An actual mature friendship was birthed between us, and that continued, continued until the day he died. He went on from Edna Manley to landing his first and only job at the Gleaner Company, which for him was very epic. That was a big deal. That was Theodore's dream job, and to land that, I just remember that being such a special time for him. Yes. He always had a dream of working at the Gleaner Company, and that dream came true. I remember distinctly when uh, he, he, uh, they have applied to the Gleaner Company, and they, sent, they, they accepted the application. And I remember we went to the high school in Brownstone to collect first his, his papers, his paperwork, to take to the Gleaner for them to, for them to accept. And so you could understand the journey. We left home to Brownstone, living in St. Anthony at the time, dro drove to Brownstone, and then from Brownstone, we we're going to use the back end, going through Bamboo and all those areas to go to Kingston to get Theodore to the Gleaner Company. And how, how important it was for us at the time that they did accept him, and we were thankful that Theodore is now in a job and becoming independent. He loved this new independence of working and paying his own bills. So much so that whenever any of us came to visit, he would make sure those bills never went over budget. So if we go there, we can't use the light a certain hour time and we don't go in the fridge and that was the old. He just got the job and he just started paying bills so he was very serious. Um, about things like that. I particularly remember Daddy one time pointed out, it's interesting how when you're living with us, you run up all our bills, but now that it's your time to pay for things, you're so, um, you're conserving. So that was interesting. Theodore is very conservative. I remember I had a vehicle when, when I was migrating to, to, to the United States. I told him that, oh, okay, Theodore, this is your vehicle now. I want you to take care of it, do the best care of it, etc. And he said, yes, dad, no problem, no problem. And he would be driving to work and back and all of that. But at some point, I found out that Theodore wasn't driving. And I could not understand why is it that Theodore is not driving the vehicle to work. But this information, he won't readily tell you. You'll have to find that out for yourself. And I... Somehow I found out that that wasn't so. And I said, Theodore, why? He said, sometimes, Dad, I don't need to drive. I can walk. As also, it is cheaper to take the bus. Why should I put so much gas into this? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, my money is going down. He was very conservative. Because, listen, if he does not have money, you won't know. Sometimes I have to be in his back to say, listen, are you okay? He's not going to tell you anything. That is the, 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 the person for which we are speaking about this afternoon. And so um, I, I can say to you that he was a perfect gem. Uh, as Daddy said, um, he lived a very simple, humble life. He was never interested in the most expensive car or any car or showing off to the persons around him. If Theodore needed to get from point A to point B, as we all know, he would be walking. 
something that used to annoy me actually because I had a very, I had a fear that he would be attacked, you know, it's Kingston. I always fear that somebody would get stupid and attack him or something like that, but him same walking, so you can't really change your mind. As I was so tired, I remember once he shared a, 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 a dead scene with me. He was going to work the morning and coming close to the company, the Gleaner company, he came around the corner and they noticed that there was a body on the ground. And he was wearing his, his uh, ID and all of that. And they thought he was a reporter from the Gleaner. And so they were trying to get him involved and to, to say, you know, to be a part of it. He says, no, I will get somebody to come and deal with you. But I remember Theodore came when he called me and he was telling me about it. He said, because he know that I'm concerned about him walking and all of that. And I just thought that here it is, that he was on his way to work that particular morning. It was just minutes before that body got shot. And he was walking in that direction. And all he did was to walk, look at the body, and walk his work. And he came and he said, Daddy, he called me and he said, Daddy, you know what I just saw? A dead body. I'm just saying that these are the things that Theodore would have experienced as he go, but he was tolerant in wanting to move forward. He was the, 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 the person who wasn't ready to want to everything because of what can happen, but he was just humbled in all his ways. Um, picking up now, and almost done. As I said, he was humble to the point where he would even conceal achievements. So, for example, it was at our wedding, mine and Dre's wedding in 2016, that I learned that he was honored as a graphic artist at his company. I didn't know that before the wedding day. He didn't say anything to me, and that's just always how he was. It was also just the other day after Theo died that I learned he was recently made employee of the month. I was told that when he was um, made employee of the month, he was questioning his supervisor, his, his, um, those who, who he answers to, and to say, why? Why am I getting this? Am I not, I'm not doing anything more than what anybody else is doing. And so again, we're just hiring out who he is, the humblest person I've ever had. And I can say here too, that uh, Theodore, you, you know that dad, daddies and son always have rivalry. There is always that between a son and a dad. Theodore and myself, we share that kind of, uh, and listen, don't get me wrong, there are times where we have troubled times, tough times. But I'm saying, having said that, Theodore is the, the, the person who would not go overboard. He is very, very humble. He is very, very manageable, if that is a, a word. He is, and though he was six feet, seven inches over my head, I remember he came to visit with us in, um, in Connecticut, Jen and I. And we went to play some football, Hurl being on the side as well. And um, we were on the same side. So we were you know, playing, and I was running for a ball. And Theodore was there, Daddy, Daddy. And everybody was there looking, who is this big man calling this little man Daddy? <laughs> I'm just showing that even in these times, this is what Theodore knew. And this is what he's going to utter as he goes by. So I'm telling you, man, he was just, I don't know. He was just different. He was, he was a gentle giant. If he did well in his basketball matches, even if the team won, he would not readily mention it unless we asked him. That was Theo. He was also so content with the simplest of things and was largely into family, as I said earlier. So for, for example, Theo looked forward to things like spending time with his nephew, Dominic. 
Uh, he adored Dom. I remember when I was pregnant last year, he said, Tara, make sure you do have a girl, you know, because you and Dre tall, so you can't have no tall long girl. And furthermore, if you have no girl, me can't teach her basketball. Mm -hmm. So for that case, have a boy. And I said, I will talk to God and see how we can work it out. He couldn't wait to start teaching Dominic how to play the game. And he loved spending time with him. He was, he was afraid at first to be around him, for example, when Dom was just born. But once he came around, he kept coming around for Dom. He also looked forward to visiting our grandmother in Montego Bay, Aunt Chris. So that's our mom's mom. Every Mother's Day and every Christmas, as long as we're headed to Aunt Chris, Taylor was good. So those are the things Taylor values. That's what he likes. That's, what, that's where he gets his joy. So for, for Tara, speaking about these trips that we normally um, do, uh, so uh, Christmas time and, um, and Mother's Day and all of that, then my mother, who was alive then, she was we, in the same direction we'll be going. So we'll take the opportunity to visit with mom in Woodstown, that's where we're originally from, and, um, and then go into Montego Bay. So that was the trend that always um, come about. And Theodore looked forward to, to be a part of that. Theo would do anything for family and was extremely loyal to his friends. Once he called you friend, that meant you were friend for life. Oh, yes. Theo was the type of person who would literally drop his life to come and add to yours in whatever way he could. When you become Theodore's friend, everybody knows. You talk about Raymond, you talk about Keneal, you talk about Andre. Andrew. Andrew, sorry. And, and, um, and Andre, <laughs> your husband. Uh, these, when Theodore speaks about his friends, everybody knows, and then they are going to be a part of his blood family. And so that is who he is. And so we were happy to be, uh, to be um, in companionship with the outer family members, as it were, and to understand that Theodore lived the life that has impacted so many. I'll just wait till he's mm -hmm. When mom died, we all took it hard, but Theo particularly took it really hard because mommy understood Theo in a way no one else did. She was his literal biggest cheerleader and motivator. There was a change in Theo when she went to sleep and I don't think he ever recovered from that. Now Theo is at peace. He will no longer feel alone without her. I really miss Theo, and I, I still can't believe this is his funeral. I honestly can't believe that we're here talking about Theo and he's in a casket. That, that, that's kind of weird. I said the same thing at mommy's funeral, and I'll say the same thing here. It's something Theo always used to say too. If we're really serious about living righteously for God and having a real authentic relationship with him, we will see Theo again because I honestly believe he, was, he will be raised Sorry, in the first resurrection when Christ Amen. comes back. I honestly don't know how to even move on tomorrow without Theo, but there's comfort in knowing I'll be beside that height again. Amen. I'll hear that laugh again. Yes. I'll see that smile again, and I'll feel that heart again. Amen. Thank you. And I just want to be to say here that my last indirect conversation with Theodore is that uh, we spoke this the Friday at Lent. Uh, we did not speak on the Saturday as normal, unless it is an emergency. But I noticed that he had sent me a, a, a video clip with a sermon that he would have watched on the Sabbath. And he, he wrote at the bottom, Pops, watch this. Uh, when I watched the video, it was Pastor Lama, John Lomacan. Bishop, right? And so um, when I saw the, the sermon, it, sp it spoke about uh, tainted glass, the tainted glass. 
And um, if someone wants to see it, I would really share that, that, that sermon with you. But pretty much, I believe in analyzing that sermon, Theodore would have listened to the voice of Jesus. I believe that that was God speaking to him in his last moments of life. And so for him to make that distinct choice to follow who Jesus is. I implore all of us this evening, or this afternoon, we are here to celebrate Theodore's life, as it were, but I want to point out that important to all of what has been said is our life that we must live if we are to be in the new, uh, new life to come. And so this is the opportunity that we all have. If we miss it, then we will be missing out on heaven. Make sure that you take on life who is life eternal, God himself. May God bless you to this end. God bless you all. Thank you so much, Tara and Mr. Johnson, for just bringing this picture into perspective. Again, just helping us to be able to imagine this life that Theo had and the, the exemplary uh, standard that he had set for us all. You know, as I listened to all the tributes and the eulogy, it brought me back to Jesus' words in Matthew 5. You know, all the things that were said about Theo, some of which came down to what Jesus spoke about. Blessed are they, blessed are the meek, rather, for they shall inherit the earth. In verse 8, he says, blessed are the pure in heart, for what? They shall see God. And Jesus also was very intimately aware of the circumstances of man. And the fact that we deal with so many things, I would need the Holy Spirit's comfort. And to that he said in verse 4, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And so today, as we seek a word from the Lord to remind us and reassure us that it is in him that we find comfort, we ask that you whisper a word of prayer in your hearts for a friend of the family, someone who has known and understood these circumstances in times prior. Pastor Omar Oliphant, whisper a word in your hearts for him as he bring com brings comfort to your heart from the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Let the church say amen. If you've been blessed by the life of Theodore. Let me hear you say amen. amen. I scanned the audience a little while back and I noticed that there is the youth ministries director from the home conference of Theodore and well the Johnson family as it then was um, Pastor Amiel Somerbell. So I'm just going to allow Pastor Somerbell a minute to just greet the family and to bring his special tribute before I share with you a brief message of hope. Thank you so much, my brother and friend, Pastor Oliphant. I'm cautious to say good afternoon. I would rather just to say afternoon. I greet you all in the name of Jesus Christ, our soon coming King. Today, I stand here uh, grieving as I felt or I feel as if I have lost a brother. It was Merville Lee Thompson who said that you give but little when you give up your possession. It is when you give up yourself that you've truly given. The reason you're all here or we're all here today is because somehow Theodore would have given a part of himself to make us better off as human beings. So as we grieve his loss, I want to encourage Elder Johnson, I want to encourage Tara. As a matter of fact, uh, if you should consider the relationship Tara and I have, if you should you know, write a timeline on the board, no, I mean a real timeline, not the timeline on Facebook. You should draw a timeline on the board of both our lives you would be uh, astonished at how similar some of the major occurrences have been. 
And so a few years ago, when we lost Sister Johnson, it was almost like me reminiscing and thinking rather, or remembering uh, the loss of my own mother. Today, I can't directly identify. So what I will say is that I'm praying for you. Uh, since I learned of Theodore's illness and his passing, I've been bearing up the family in prayer. Just know that my family and I are grieving with you and we are praying for you. Finally, I will say this much. There's a song that asks a very crucial question. It says, will your anchor hold in the storms of life when the clouds unfold their winds of strife, when the strong tides lift and the cables strain, will your anchor drift or will it firm remain? The chorus says, we have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll, fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. God bless. Amen and amen. The life of Theodore Johnson has been properly narrated today. I won't go over and I won't have time to share my own encounters, many of which are hidden within the family home where I was taken in years ago when I began ministry. And that's how both Theodore and Tara have become so special in my life and I also have become special in theirs. So much so that Ella Johnson, you, you know, you, every, every family has a pastor and I'm so happy to be able to serve and to minister within this family and at this special crucial moment. I wanna share with you three thoughts from a very sacred psalm, the 90th division of the psalm. It is a psalm which calls our attention to the eternal God and to the frailty of man. It is a psalm which, as Tara will tell you, as an English language and English literature specialist, is filled with similes and metaphors which describe the human sojourn and the human experience. Sister Johnson, it opens with a very potent, a very powerful sentence. We today say it, but then it was sung. The psalmist says, Lord, you are our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you formed the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. He echoes the words and shifts from the focus of the divinity and the awesome grandeur of the sovereign ruler of the universe. And he, he shows the encounter that this majestical being, the sovereign God, has with human beings and he says in verse 3 you turn man to destruction and say return O children of men he pros and he shows the difference between the divine and the human when he says for a thousand years in your sight or as yesterday when it is past and like a watch in a night you carry them away like a flood. They are like a sleep. In the morning, they are like grass which grows up. And in the morning, it flourishes and grows up. And in the evening, says the word, it is cut down and it is with and it withers. He goes on and he describes it and he speaks about the pain that is in the hearts of the family members at this moment for he says for we are consumed by your anger and by your wrath we are terrified you have set our iniquities before you our secret sins in the light of your countenance for all our days have passed away in your wrath we finish our years like a sigh 
And then he comes to the part that I would like to grapple with for a few moments, Pastor. He comes to the point, Tara, when he says, for the days of our years are 70 years. And if by reason of strength they are 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For as your fear, so is your wrath. And then the summation, the climax for me of the psalm. So teach us, Andre, to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. I've chosen to entitle the charge for this today, the homily for today, making it count. Making it count. Eternal Father, right now in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death, spring forth life and hope in the midst of pain and sorrow and agony. And where there are griefs and where there indeed tears fall, quiet our hearts before you and stimulate our minds towards a better hope is our prayer and our asking in Jesus' name. Amen. There is something about a youth who keeps his focus, is good at what he does, and who remains humble through it all. The life of Theodore was not only a life that was centered on basketball and creative energy. Without a doubt, he was artistic. And he was a firm Christian who modeled the heritage of his parents passed on to him from one generation to the next. But there's a part of the eulogy, which perhaps not intentional, but which no less was left out, that I don't want to be lost on the minds of those who are watching on YouTube or otherwise. And it is the fact that Theodore surrendered his life to Christ. This is very significant because where we are today at Roman's funeral home, 23 Don Robin Road in Kingston. When you enter in the lobby, there is a sign on the door. The sign says there is life after death. The sign points to the fact that even though the believer may lose the breath of life and the body is interred in the ground, it points to the fact that something better is coming. The sign on the door that is when you enter through the door, right on the wall, it points and the word life, I believe, is written in blue, speaking about a new beginning, speaking about a fresh encounter, an imagery that artistic individuals like Theodore and Kevin will understand points to hope and it points to meaning. It's a, it's a color that radiates with life. And today, in as much as we are celebrating, and I'm happy that we are able to put into words the memories that we have had with such a beautiful treasure from God. Today, as we have done so, I, however, would like to draw from his love of basketball and bring about three points and leave those with you as you seek to reminisce on this important life that God has loaned to us for a time. Every now and then in the journey of life, God has to stop us and God has to remind us that we are mortal beings. Every now and then along the journey of life, God has to remind us that in spite of our power, in spite of our wealth, in spite of our ability to invent and to reinvent and to shape and to carve out new inventions, God has to remind us that ultimately he is the coach who is guiding the basketball team. 
There are three lessons that I would like to draw for me is the love of basketball. I'm not a basketballer. That's not my particular sport, but that was his love. And there are three particular things that I would like to draw from it. The first that I would like to pull from it is that in basketball, being a team matters. Somebody not with the preacher. I said in basketball, being a team matters. You see, you can be a part of a group, but the group is not a team. You, you can be a part of a number, but you're not unified. I would like to suggest to each of us here this evening, that this afternoon, that more important than uh, Theodore having lived a life, more important than Theodore having had the experience of working at RJR, Gleaner Company Limited, that it was important that he played his part well on the team. I would like to suggest that not only was uh, Theodore a part of the team of the Johnson clan, not only has he left behind uh, his only sibling, his, uh, his father, not only is he leaving behind colleagues, but I'm here to tell you that he was part of a team that was marching to Zion. You see, brothers and sisters, it's not just the basketball team that matters. It is the team that is playing on the Lord's side. There is a kingdom which is to come. It is an everlasting kingdom. It is a kingdom which transcends time. It is a kingdom which transcends the mortal world. And more important than being a part of the team here on earth, he was a part of God's team. The second point I would like to leave with you this afternoon is that not only being a part of the team matters, but I would like to draw from the fact that in basketball, time matters. Mm, I wish I had time. I don't have time. I said it's not only being a part of the team that matters, but being a part of a basketball team, you know that from the moment that whistle is blown, and you know from that moment when the ball is sent, that the game, as much as it is painful, in as much as it is grieving to the heart, I would like to say to those young ones who are watching, I would like to say to those of us who are still playing in the river and on the bank when it comes to matters of faith and our spirituality and being grounded in God, we do not have long here. We do not have a lot of time left. The whistle is about to blow. I don't know who is about to be taken off the court. I don't know whose time is about to be up. But I came here to remind the brethren that in basketball time matters. You cannot use the most productive season of your life wasting it around there is a semi-finals to get to there is a quarter finals to get to there is a finals to get to you cannot be armoring and moving all over the place as though you have no purpose Theodore understood the value of time he knew that time was short he knew he didn't have a long time on the court I see many young people today thinking that because their parents live to 70, they will live too. I see many children today who rather than they having to bury their parents like Elder Johnson, Elder Johnson today is burying his son. Life is not always what we want it. The game, even when Kobe Bryant is on the, on the, on the, on the field, the, the, the game, even when Michael Jordan is playing, it does not always end up with the same result. So there's a third and final one before I take my seat. Not only does team matter, not only did Theodore link himself to a team, not only does time matter, but I'd like to say to you today, scoring also matters. You see, brethren, uh, playing on a basketball, playing in any sport, you play to win. You're in it 
to win it. As my brother would like to say, you either go hard or you go home. If you're going to be entering into the arena of the sporting circle, you must be willing, you must be aware that in that sphere, in that space, you have to score. That is the purpose of the game. And brothers and sisters, you have heard it already, that he was very well aware, Theodore was very well aware, that on the, on the, on, on the court, he was not the person who, was, who could score. But guess what? He found his place on the court as the defense, and he ensured that he did it and brought it home for his team. But church, scoring matters. I am not a ma mathematician. I'm not always able to get 10 and 10 correct. Like Tara, my skills are more in the literary realm than the numerical realm. But the psalmist calls our attention to not just living, but to living productive lives. There's a reason that we can stand here today and celebrate the life of Theodore. And it is because it's not the number of years in your life that counts, but the number of life in your years. Dying at 33, your breath being cut off at such a young age does not mean that you have failed. Does not mean that you have not lived a purposeful life. Does not mean that your life does not have value or worth. Your life at cut off at 33 does not mean that it had no special purpose of dignity or a life for those around us. In fact, I can assure you that if it were not COVID period, Sentence Bay Church would be here. North Jamaica Conference would be here. His co-workers from elsewhere would be here. It is not the number of years. Yes, we would have wanted him to live longer. Yes, we would have preferred for him for, to, to have been here with us. But I'm here to tell you, when there is a God who orders your steps, everything is well done. The Lord promises that he will comfort his children. The Lord promises that even when it seems as though we are going through the valley of the shadow of death, we need not fear any evil. evil. You can cry all you want to cry tonight. Let the tears flow. I want you to know tears is a language that God perfectly understands. But one thing I will tell you, because God knows never misses any shot that he has taken on the home court because God has never missed and failed his team members because God is the kind of God who will number your days and mark it to its very exact moment he knows when you were born he knows when you are going to die he understands the value and the impact of your life you need not worry you need not weep as those that have no hope for weeping may endure for a night but I'm here to tell you if you have come on God's team if you have played on God's court if you have surrendered to the coach of heaven your life will resurrect with those when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise if all we have Dr. Fletcher in a time like this, is memory. It won't be enough. If all we have in a moment like this are beautiful reflections, it will never be enough. But if in a moment like this, Sister Claudette, we can have a hope that pierces beyond COVID, if we can have a hope that pierces beyond sickness, if in a moment like this we can have a true hope that pierces beyond death, then rest assured, when the coach of Theodore's basketball team comes home, when in fact uh, uh, time on earth has surrendered, and indeed, the saints are resurrected to journey home. You will know 
that even though in this life we may experience death, in the new Jerusalem, like that sign, there is life. After death, we will live forevermore. I'm going to invite the congregation to stand, the family members to remain seated as we pray a prayer of comfort for the family, as we pray for those who at this time feel it the most. Heavenly Father, you have never erred. Even when we cannot understand you, even when your purposes we cannot see, you have never failed your children. But here in this very room is a daughter who has lost her mom, a daughter who has lost her brother, who will no longer get a WhatsApp message, and who will never hear that precious voice. Here in this very room, we have a father who has lost his only son, whose heart is empty and which bleeds because even he after whose name he has been given is now asleep. He will never be able to hear his voice again. We pray, Lord, that thou alone who knows how to comfort your children may bear up Tara when she gets weak, may keep and sustain Ella Johnson when the memories breaks him down even as a big grown man. Lord, the empty space and the empty void can only be filled by you. So as we number our days, help us to remember that we ourselves need to make our calling and our election sure. Use the life of Theodore Johnson as a beacon of light for all those who have come in contact with him, that they may know that to serve God matters. And to live for him in this wicked world counts. So in between it all, bless and keep, sustain and comfort your children. Is our prayer and asking in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand as we sing the closing hymn printed on the inset of our program. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout for victory. At the singing of the second verse, I'm going to invite the Paul bearers to take their positions. And when we reach the third verse, the body will exit to the hearse as we prepare to go to Medores. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. Oh, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we will sing and shout for victory. While we walk the pilgrim's pathway, streets will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. Oh, when we all get
get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We will sing and shout for victory. Let us then, let us then be true and faithful, just in serving every day. Just one glimpse of him in glory will the toys of life repay. Oh, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Oh, when we all see Jesus, we will sing and shout for victory. Paul Bearers, onward to the prize before us soon his beauty will behold soon the pearly gates will open we shall tread the streets of gold everybody when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing be proceeding to Medores and those who are online will be interring the body at Medores Memorial Gardens in St. Catherine. <laughs> 